Hello friends and welcome to this video on value mapping. We'll go through what static value mapping and dynamic value mapping is and it has to do with faders and joystick on Skyhoy controllers. As an example, sometimes you would like a fader to not go through a range of values in a linear fashion. You would like it to follow a curve and that's what this video is about. And the same with the joystick, of course. And there are different methods you can apply inside of Reactor, the blue pill uh, platform-based panel management software we have made. So to go through this, I have uh, created a configuration that you are free to download. And uh, I'll just quickly go through and let you know what we have here. It is based on a Rack Fusion Live and an awesome PV2 with more rise faders. So if you go to the home screen of Reactor, this is what you see. These two are actually not panels that I'm connected to because even though I have a, this is the RCPV2 with motorized fader here, and also a Rack Fusion Live, which is uh, somewhat our favorite panel because it has joysticks, faders, knobs, and buttons, and displays all over the place. I have these two panels available as virtual versions. And let's just quickly check that out. So in this web browser, sorry for the, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah. So I have a virtual version of the uh, RCPV2 with motorized fader and also the Rack Fusion Live in this emulated environment. This emulator is called Raw Panel Dummies and you can emulate any Skyhoy panel using Raw Panel Dummies. It's a free download from our website. So go check it out if you need. And it does exactly the same as the hardware. It's just much easier for me to show you on screen. So I have also connected these two in a single configuration called value mapping, which is one that I have created. So a custom configuration. And how is that done? Well, let me just give you a little bit of insight into that. So if you look here at the tree in the configuration tab, you see a, um, let me see, probably this one, the one called value ma mapping. That is the configuration that the home screen mentions. Yes, value mapping, it's right there. And if we go in here, you can see this configuration is uh, like th this layer here is the root. And on that root, if we click edit raw, then you get a glimpse into the configuration code that makes up that whole configuration that I'm about to go through. So uh, this code editor embedded inside Reactor is uh, really amazing. You, you can do very advanced code editing in here. So um, yeah, feel free to dive into that. But the main point is that on the kind of first level, on this configuration, which is JSON, something that a lot of people know how to code and react uh, or interact with, you see panel mapping. Panel mapping is a mention of two panels that are the assumed panels that goes into this configuration. One is a Rack Fusion Live, different variants are mentioned, and another one, panel number two, is the RCPV2 Motorized Fader. And um, a little later in this configuration, if I just collapse it here and we open what is called HVC key map, then you see inside of this key map, we have mentions of references to the first panel, panel number one, and hardware component ID 24. And there is a behavior with an alias we call fader, and that is mapped to this one. But actually, that fader behavior, which we'll change by changing layers soon, is also mapped to panel number two, component 43. It means that the same configuration for fader is mapped onto the, the non-motorized fader on the um, Red Fusion Live as well as on the motorized fader here. So there is a, some subtle points here. One of them is that two panels goes together into this configuration as if they were one. And that's the modularity Skahoy spent so much time developing and making a reality for you guys. And the second part is that whenever you have a behavior, you can actually map it to multiple components even though they are different types and so on. We see that a few other times here. We see it for the, uh, let me see, no, sorry. About, no, 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 there's U1, which is essentially just a behavior we have made to map a value onto a display for convenience reasons. You'll see that uh, a few places on uh, inside this uh, emulated environment, you can see that we show the speed, which is a value that we are going to change using the joystick on the, Rack Fusion Live, we can also see there's a navigation button here and that navigation button is also for convenience available over here. So that's the same thing. And by the way, down here on the 
RCP V2, motorized fader, we also have a value range right here in this display just to see what that value is. Now, and that's all happening in this HVC key map mapping. That is also available in the UI. So if you go back to the configuration, then if we open up this one, you see that key map is right there. So if you click it, you have a UI that will show you the same things. But we are going to work a little bit inside the JSON. So I kind of hope that you will um, take that in and um, like, I hope you'll fall in love with Jason <laughs> because it's going to be so useful for you. And I tend to swap in and out because sometimes the UI is just super cool and other times Jason is much faster. But we'll inspect much of what we do today in this way. So uh, apart from that, we have a variable defined called test type. And basically test type is, um, let me just enable simulation here and let's go to the right fusion live. Then uh, I have a, a button mapped uh, up here and on that, no, this one. And if I press this one, it is basically swapping the test type variable between static and dynamic as the values. And that value, whether it's static or dynamic, is what will create visibility for either the static value mapping or the dynamic value mapping layer in the configuration. You see, as we are now having the value um, on dynamic, then this layer is available. And that is for the next video. So we'll just put it back. And we can either do that here or we could have done it over here in the inspector. But now the value of test type is static. And that means this is the layer uh, structure that is now available or uh, enabled. Inside of that one, I've even created a, a number of pages. And those pages is driven by the variable called select page. And if that has the value 1, 5, page 7, page 3, page 2, page 6, then either of these layers will be visible and that will be the, the one that defines what is the behavior of the fader alias going to be. That fader alias being the one that we just saw was mapped to the fader here or the motorized fader. So uh, I want to start out by uh, basically uh, resetting this to back to what is called straight. Okay. And this is a four way button just using step change. So it goes through all the values of the select page variable, which by the way is set up here a little bit unordered. Forgive me for that. But uh, we are right now on the value called straight. It means that none of these layers that would uh, occlude the, uh, the base layer here is uh, none of those are available. So it's basically this behavior that drives it all. So if we look inside the JSON for this one, what we can see is that we are manipulating a variable called absolute. And that's the one we have right here. And there's also one called speed. And that's for the joystick. So um, yeah, for those of you who are working here, you may know that we have um, from our panels, when you have a fader, it goes through the range from zero to 1000. When you have a joystick, it goes from minus 500 to plus 500. And uh, just to make that value um, visible to us, then I've created a variable called absolute, which is going from zero to 1000. And then also one called speed that goes from minus 500 to plus 500. And we are going to manipulate those variables. And they are also the ones being shown in the displays. So in this way, as I'm moving the fader, it is manipulating a variable that is basically a one-to-one -one relationship to the range that the fader has. And in this sense, I hope it will be visible for you how these value mapping curves that we are going to work with applies. And the first thing to just make this easy would be to uh, go with this one, which the um, the, the straight, because it manipulates the absolute variable. And um, this feedback default is related to the motorized fader. But let's just first move the variable. So now we are in the configuration tab and I have the uh, simulation mode enabled. It means that as I'm moving this fader, you can see that it is changing the value, which is just shown in this display. It is changing that through the range. Now, what I want you to notice is that as I hit the bottom here, it, it's zero. Up here, it's it's uh, one thousand, and somewhere in the middle, pretty much exactly in the middle, it's five hundred. If I go two thirds up, like here, it's about seven hundred and fifty, and if I go one, th sorry, three th <laughs> quarters up, and here one quarter up then we are around 250. I think that is valuable for you to notice because in a moment we'll change over to a different curve. And that um, could be, let, let us take the uh, power curve. Yes. So what happens now as I change this variable is that this layer is, is now visible. And if we click on the behavior fader and we just inspect it over here, then 
you see that something changed inside this configuration. We're still using the parent ID, sorry, uh, called Skahoy Fader, which is like a foundational behavior definition in the system. Actually, it's it's shown here. If you click here and you just format this, then you see uh, this is all the code with the event handlers, and there's a, an event handler called change. So that defines how the, um, the, 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 the fader works. And there's also feedback default, which is defining the display text for the fader, intensity, uh, color, and a lot of other things here. And whatever else we put in here is basically overriding those uh, properties that are in Skahoy fader. We always set the IO reference because many of these master behaviors are designed to just take an IO reference and do something useful with it, like moving it through its entire range, like it's doing right here. And what it did on this behavior down here, where it basically just ignored this for a moment. All we needed was to use this master behavior and tell it this is the variable we want you to adjust. And it just does that linearly. But as we now inspect what's happening up here, then the addition that I've made is that I extend the event handler called change. That event handler was inside here in the, um, th this is Skahoy colon fader, the underlying master behavior. And this is the event handler that I'm now ex extending by adding static value mapping information. Just disregard binary set values and IO reference. They uh, are empty in this case and won't harm anybody, but this is a new thing. And that new thing you see right here, the um, static value mapping, it, it's, it doesn't even have a UI. This is so fresh. This is like from last weekend. and uh, But it's in the latest release of React. So you can use it, but you need to use it in a JSON form. And someday, someday, maybe, we'll see, it will have a UI component. Right now, this is how you get the latest and greatest features of React using the JSON. It tells us that it should use a mapping curve called power. The power is 2.1 and it has to have inversion on. And then also in the feedback default, we'll see that is relevant for the motorized fader. It has also a static value mapping defined so that the feedback, I mean, whenever we are going the other way around, we're basically telling the, uh, sorry, a motorized fader, go to this position based on this input value from the variable called absolute. But you need to correct yourself by the inverse of what happened when that value was set. Otherwise, it would calculate the position wrong. Anyway, let's first see what happens because now we have this, this layer enabled. Okay, And as I'm moving the fader, notice the values up here. It's different from before. If I move to the center, it is not 500 anymore. It is 700. And if I move like three quarters up, it's 880. If I move one quarter up, it's basically about uh, around 500, which was the middle value before. Okay, so you see, but but zero is zero and 1000 is 1000. So basically we have between those two extremes, we have a different mapping between the input value from the fader that would be a linear range from zero to 1000 to the output that affects our absolute value here. And that could be vol volume in dB or something else in a device where it is more, it is better for us to have what I would say is higher resolution in the high end. So uh, for instance, for volume, if you want to have your fader more sensitive in the high end, close to zero to B and so on, then you would probably choose a power curve like this. So to illustrate this, I have actually made a little spreadsheet. So let's just quickly move over to the spreadsheet. And here you see the power function. I have typed in the value 2.2 in this spreadsheet here. And basically what it says is, oh, these are the step values. And then on the forward, then it is taking the power of that one using this value as the power we are raising the value in, in a normalized way. So it is divided down by 1000 and then multiplied by 1000 later again. And um, so that's basically what is generating the output. In other words, these values are the output from these values based on this power. And then you see this kind of curve. So the default scenario would be that we just have a straight line going through as we are inputting these values from the fader, these are the output values on the other side. Let's let's check if this actually works. So uh, let's just take the value uh, of, of the fader and say, let's place it around 250 right here. And it turns out to produce a 500, an output value of 500. So 
if, if we go into this one, let's go to 250 and then read out. Nah, okay, it actually looks like we should get the value 50 if we go in 250. Here. But now, the thing is that we are not actually using the power curve in this version. We're using the inverse of that. And I can show you what I mean by, let me see, uh, go back to the JSON code right here. We are actually having the invert flag on. And the invert flag means that it's, it's mirrored in that uh, line uh, y equals x. Basically, this 45 degree line is a mirror of what we actually get when we have invert on. Well, why not just try to turn it off okay, and see what happens. Okay, let, let's just check. Yeah, hmm, pretty good. Actually, now that I turned it off, I get exactly this curve. And as I'm now 250 in more or less, then I get around 50 as the output. Let's try something else and see if we can predict what would happen around the middle. We would get a value around 200, 210, 220, something like that. Let's move to the middle. It's pretty close. All right. So there you see, this is the, um, the that that was the effect of um, invert on and off here. But um, the, the right thing for us would be to have inversion on. Actually, if you wanted to do this, then mathematically, that would be the same as taking the inverse of this value. So that would be one divided by 2.2. And then that means this is the curve that we actually do want to follow in this case. Okay, so um, ah, it's 2.1, whatever. Um, but let's just put this back. To, well, we can also keep it because, okay, let's just reload. I let me see. Yeah, because okay, I just wanted to to show you that now that let, let's involve the motorized fader and we see that we are having the power curve mapping with power 2.1 here. Inversion is off and inversion is off down here. Now, let's try to involve the motorized fader. I will just enable. So now what I'm doing is I'm bringing this up so we can see both things at the same time. All right. So over here next to us, we should see this fader over here move along as I'm now moving this. You can see. Okay. So this fader is responding to the uh, the value I'm moving this in. Just like it, it, it. Imagine this is a physical motorized fader because it will be on the physical panel. But you see that it is. As I'm changing the value here, that fader is not moving into the right position, right? And that's because we just changed the inversion flag on that one to be the same as what was defined for the feedback. Because the feedback down here, this configuration, let me just make this bigger for you. This is what tells this action to, um, to send an extended return value to the panel of the type position, meaning that there's a, an, an element. We know this is a motorized fader. So, it will receive a position to go to and it will go through this static value mapping before it happens with this power and this inversion here. All right. But unfortunately, the inversion in both cases is the same and it actually should be the exact opposite. So if I type in on here, which is what would be correct for our nice little fader, then you'll see these two are now following along. Because remember, I'm basically with the fader on the left side, I'm changing the value. We can see it being read out here. And we know that around in the middle, we will have 700. And then if we send the value 700 to this fader, it has to do the inverse calculation to make sure that the, the, the fader ends up in the middle. By the way, if I move this fader, I'll move the value up here, but this one won't move over here because that's not a motorized fader. That is a static fader, a fixed fader. And that's what dynamic value mapping actually can help us uh, deal with. So we'll get back to that uh, at a later point. You know, what happens if that value of a fader is changing? Um, that's, that's what that's all about. Okay, so um, we have other types of value mapping as well. We have a sine curve. So if I go to this one and um, um, Let's just move over to see if we can find it. Sign right there. Okay, so what would this be all about? Let's just make this bigger so we can see it in here. Now we are looking at the sign. So in the middle, we also are around 500. That's actually not changed. But as we move towards the end, you can see we are somehow accelerated a little bit. Normally, this would be around 750. 
down here it would be about 250, but it's not, it's closer to the end. And that is because the sine curve is an ease in, ease out curve. And ease in, ease out looks like this. So basically, instead of having the linear mapping, we have something which is kind of having a slow start, and then it goes through the exact center, and then it also has a slow approach to the ending value. I think this could be interesting for faders like this if you want to do a transition. I'm not exactly sure how you'll apply it, and it doesn't have any parameters, it's just this ease in, ease out. I put it in there, and it's here. Have fun with it in the JSON. It looks like this. It does have the invert though. So once again, to have it function with a motorized fader, you have to have inversion either turned on down here, or if you want the opposite, you have to turn on inversion up here and have it turned off down here for the position of the fader to work out correctly. And that is actually demonstrated in the um, example here called inverted power. So let's check that out. Let's see inverted power. Uh, what is that? Let's check it. And you see that in this case, uh, ooh, that was not entirely true. It's actually because there is a already a feature inside of a reactor that is called inversion. Inversion means that we'll invert the range of the fader. Uh, you'll see exactly what I mean now because, you know, at the bottom, instead we get 1000 and at the top we get zero. And if you, and, and when are we using that? Oh, for iris. Uh, quite often when you have a um, panel with a, um, a lens, then you, uh, when you have the fader on top, you want your iris of a lens to be fully open. And that's all, often the, the smallest value, like 2.8 or 1.4 or something. And then you want it in the bottom to be the highest value. That could be F32. So, Therefore, to adjust such a value range, which um, in, in a parameter, you need the ability to invert a fader to do the exact opposite. And that is, this is an example of that. So in this example, the code shows you that the invert condition, if you set that to true, and this is an example that is found in one of our master behaviors as well. If you set this to true, it's gonna inverse the range. It's still going to apply the value mapping and then um, if you if you do that inversion, then you also have to use the or change the IO reference being used for the extended feedback to be the normalized inverted, so that the um, positioning of the of the uh, motorized fader is also correctly picking up that inversion. And this is just demonstrating that it's possible to use that feature alongside the static value mapping if you want. You still need to have invert on and off so that this functions. So since this involves the motorized fader, let's just check it out by seeing the motorized fader here on the screen along with us. So if we try to move it, in this case, we can see it starts at zero and it should follow us along we still see around the middle here we clearly do have value mapping applied in this case but it also seems that the fader here functions exactly as it should the motorized fader so it's all good now um, we do not only have mathematical conversions like power and sign and in, um, in in this case the inverted power we also do have actual mapping tables so let me give you an example, of, and that, that's sort of a crazy example. And there's also a sane example. So the crazy example is, what if we have something like this, where we would say, hmm, anytime we have a value between 0 and 200, nothing is going to happen on the output side. Then from 200 to 400, we are going through the range from 0 to 1,000, from 400 to 600. We are going the opposite way. And then from 600 to 800, we are again going from 0 to 1,000. And then from 800 to... 1000 it's undefined and that's possible now let's see how that looks and we'll just go to map number one this one yes all right so are you ready let's move the fader and you want to see the value up here all right so we have it here let's just check it out in json real quick so the event handler looks like this it is uh, set to a type called coordinates or chords. And we have these coordinate pairs. And the first pair is 0, 0.0. The next one is 
point, uh, point zero, and then 400 point 1000. So basically, it is this point, this point, this point, this point, this point in a coordinate system from 0, 0.0 to 1000 point 1000. Yes. All right. So that is my mapping. Now, keep this in mind, take a mental picture of this guy. And let's go. So I'm at zero, I'm moving the fade up the first one fifth nothing is going to happen. But then just notice what happens about now. It's starting to kick in. And within the next one fifth of the range, we are going all the way up to 1000. There we had 1000. Yeah. So we are now two fifth up. Then on the next fifth of the range, you'll see it's going down to zero again. And then it is going up to 1000 again. And then as we hit around 1000, happening around here, I can't hit the value exactly, then it is now undefined. Undefined basically means that it's just taking the default mapping, which is the linear curve. All right. Now, this is obviously just crazy. It has no real world application. But I wanted to show you that it's possible to insert such data points in this mapping and then have the output value follow that. If you followed along, then the motorized fader on the right side is actually struggling somehow. It's, it's definitely not following this position. And the reason is that there'll be multiple values. I mean, all it can do is to just, yeah, apparently do something like what happens over here. Why is that? This is because if the inverted version of that curve is what you see right here. And basically, it, it just says that, um, you know, anytime we have an input value from, let me see. Um, yeah, it's going to give us a mapping that when it finds a value between zero and 1000, it is, it is not clear whether it should return a value like 200 if it is zero or 600. And in fact, this, uh, the fact is that it's going to return 200. So basically going from this range from zero to 1000 will bring us the output range from 200 to 400 all the time. Because um, yeah, it could also be 600 to 800. But this is the um, ambiguity that is associated with this mapping. And therefore, um, there's, there's not a clear one to one mapping for this. And that's why it does that. Now, that's actually what I'm demonstrating in map number two here. So if I just change over to map number two, then you see exactly that happening. Let's check it out. Then um, I am. Eh, was that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm using inversion. I'm inverting it. Basically, what it means is I'm taking this one and giving it this one. So let's just check this once again. If I'm moving the fader in this range, you see 200 it's going all the way up to 400. Now, the fader is now going from the whole range, right? Because this is now going from 200 to 400. As this is in this scenario, it's not inverted. Now, it, that is the one which is um, set to off like this. Okay, this is, um, yeah. Let's get to the real world example, because what I wanted to show you is that if you do not want just a mathematical power curve, or if you don't want the sine curve, you could also take your spreadsheet and then develop a number of data points yourself that gives you the exact curve that you're after. And you should, um, yeah, you should make sure that you have, ah, what is the mathematical term? The point is that we don't have any situation like this where one x value can become two y values. Uh, it has a name. But definitely, if you have a set of data points like this, you can type those in. And this one is taken out of a software called Globcon, which is used to control Prodigy MP audio devices. So that is actually their fader, fader mapping. It comes pretty close, I would say, to the power function that we observed here, where in this case, uh, maybe power of two. But something like that is pretty close to this curve that they are using. So you could either use the exact table here, which is one that I have deducted from their software by simply counting pixels and values, or you could use the power curve. But this is actually implemented in my third example of mapping, which is, let's just go to it right here. So we have that definition of the behavior right here. Let's check it out. And um, I have this basically these coordinate pairs is coming out of my spreadsheet and put in here 
all the way. In this case, it is not inverted, but for my motorized fader, it is inverted. So the same data set, but inversion is on. So let's uh, let's check this out. We uh, have zero, we have 1000, and we are in the middle, we are around 700. So it looks a little bit like the power curve we have before, and we can also see the motorized fader is going to follow along really nicely over here. So that's just all great. Before we end this super long video, we'll also have to look at the joystick. That is one thing I completely ignored all the way because I wanted to focus on the fader at first. So we have looked at all these fader behaviors, definitions of the fader behavior, and now we'll also look at definition for the joystick. So it is much the same. Let's uh, start out by looking at the straight version. So the straight version is um, this up down behavior that we have defined. And if I operate it, you'll see that it is ranging from zero to 500 all the way down to minus 500. So the principle is exactly the same. But on the way from zero to one to 500, whenever we apply the, the power curve, the sign, the mapping, it will be basically that range is going to be extended to an internal range from zero to 1000. Then we apply the curve and then we shrink it back to a range from zero to 500. And if we have a, um, a minus sign in front, if it's the negative range from zero to minus 500, we are temporarily removing the minus and then calculating it the same way, multiplying it by two, make the transformation and dividing it by two again. And then we apply the, um, the sign uh, on the value. So it's symmetric around the center. All right, let's move on this one. So we, we this is just the standard stuff, right? It just goes between these values. By the way, I'm sorry that it's not resetting. I'm pretty, I would say this is a mistake inside of our emulator in Reactor. And it might be fixed the moment you watch this video because whenever we, if we use the emulation over here and I release it, then it goes back to zero, corresponding to a spring-loaded joystick. Thank you. Now, um, let's go to the, let me see, let's do the power case again. Power, yes. So let's check, how did I apply uh, power to this one? I just took a power of three. So what does that mean? It means as I'm now moving here, you can see that it has a very slow start and then it will you know, accelerate quite a bit up to the end, 500. By the way, on the little arrow here, you can actually see the value that the joystick is sending. So there you see the input value basically. And by the way, just to show you that this is symmetrical around the center, then, you know, I'm doing the same in the opposite direction and you see that. Okay, maybe, um, yeah, that the power curve is, is um, it could potentially be pretty cool for the joystick. Now imagine this, you want to have your joystick just having, you know, on, on the first part of the range, you want it to be really slow for whatever reason. I mean, it, this could be depend on your camera. I know some people have, have asked me, uh, is it possible to have like a logarithmic curve applied to my joystick? And I'm not always sure if they mean that they want to accelerate quicker to a higher speed or the opposite, but definitely this value mapping, static value mapping, you can do that. You can use this value between one and 10, which is like the range it goes in, and you can use inversion to have it do it the other way around. Just think about the spreadsheet I showed you earlier. So definitely power should be something that some people might want to apply to the joystick for certain cameras, depending on how the camera takes up the speed. Let's go to, um, uh, to the sign. In this case, I uh, just applied the, the sign version of this one. So what should we expect to see? Well, once again, we'll see a slow start, but around the center, around 250 here, we should see pretty much the same value. And then we should see some sort of slowing down, or uh, no, wait, actually some sort of acceleration towards the end here at the same time. Uh, I am not so sure this is useful for the joystick. Let's move on to the, um, see, I didn't do anything for the inverted version. So we should probably just get to the mapping and um, we take the first map. So the up down definition for this one, I have a coordinate pair, which is uh, simply, I have not illustrated this in a spreadsheet, but 0.0, .0 and then at 1000, we go to 800. That should basically mean that we're just limiting the range. In other words, when we get to full swing, we won't go any higher than 80%, basically, which would be 400. Let's try. 
Okay, you see, I'm now, now at full swing 500, but I get 400 on the output. And I can go the other way and get the same thing. As I said, it's symmetrical around the center. So this is a static way to basically limit the range of the joystick. We move on to map number two and see what that has for us. So let's check that again. Now, uh, in this case, I'm sort of doing the opposite. I'm saying let's have a larger death zone around the center of the joystick and then just go up to 1000 at the end. So basically, we'll see that as I'm moving it. Notice that I need to move the joystick up to around a value of 100 before anything happens to the speed value. And that happens now. And then it's just linear all the way to the top. And it should be the same in the other direction. When we get close to minus 100, yes, there we go, all the way off to minus 500. So that's what this mapping does. And then let's see what the final mapping has to offer us. Nothing, because I did not update or add any new definition of the up-down uh, behavior that I defined for the joystick. So thanks for watching this video. And now you know everything about the features we have for static value mapping of the analog and speed values that goes out um, to uh, from joysticks and uh, faders on Skyhoy panels and how you can modify those, including the feedback that could come back to a motorized fader so that you can make sure this fader is also correctly inversing the value coming back from the parameter you're adjusting.